We've had uh, the deployment, the rollout start in the UK. We're expecting that imminently in the US as well. We've had, of course, documentation of some of the adverse effects, uh, people with allergies having more of the adverse effects. We've also uh, just seen more trials being conducted from various makers. I'm wondering when it comes to the psychology of getting people to take the vaccine, is looking for perfection in a COVID vaccine something that's going to be detrimental to this ultimate goal of herd immunity? Uh, well, first of all, you have to you just you gotta have proof that there will be a herd immunity. If I have a safe and effective vaccine, I want to take it. Um, and you always get into the questions of what do you mean by safe? What's acceptable? And, you know, all of virtually all of biology, all of what we do in life is sort of a trade off. You cross streets knowing you could get hit by a car. I mean, it's a trade off. Everything is a trade off because it's ridiculously low possibility that you're going to get hit by a car. You go out sometimes when it rains, you might get hit by lightning, but it's very a low probability. But this is so far looks like a very low probability of anything really happening that's not safe. Uh, so, you know, I don't bank on herd immunity. A lot of people talk about it, but you don't know you're going to get it. And um, so I, to answer your question, I, I think you do as best you can with the vaccine. And it looks to me like they've done pretty well with the messenger RNA vaccines. And um, it, it's rather exciting the percent of efficacy that they have achieved in this preliminary study. We need to see it, the data ourselves, I mean, the scientific community. We need to see that it covers all groups. And that may not be the case. But then you have to then say, OK, maybe not this group or that group, but it works for the bulk. That would still be a substantial advance. My concern and I don't want to say this as a negative for the vaccine. I think people should take the vaccine, uh, as I will. Uh, but I give a little concern in that I suspect, I have a suspicion from the start that these vaccines to the spike protein, which they are, may not last long. Under six months is what I was thinking. And I have reasons for that. Too difficult to describe here, take up too much of your time. Um, but I still have that, let's call it, wonder about it. Um, we were proposing back in February to use nonspecific vaccines. Sounds crazy, but things like the measles, mumps, rubella vaccine, things like oral polio, live virus vaccines to stimulate what we call innate immunity. That's different than your conventional vaccines that rest on specific antibodies and specific T cells. It is known that innate immune stimulation can be broadly helpful against a whole wide number of viruses, particularly viruses that cause lung infections. And so we advocated for that. Their downside is that they're never durable. They may be a few months at most. So what do you do after a few months? But we thought, you know, you might be able to boost once after you wait a while so that you can get a take again. Maybe you can use a combination of the one with another, uh, you know, the coming back with another and maybe get a half a year out of it, maybe even longer. I think if we did that to the whole world, then it was possibly doable because it's cheap. These vaccines are cheap. They're available. They're already produced. Mm. There's the known safety of them that we could have broken the back of this pandemic long ago, back in February. I thought when we went forward, but it was decided but, that you have to pursue these vaccines, the conventional vaccines. And then they're, Dr. And they're Geller, I'm wondering if you think there's going to be I'm wondering if you think there's going to be success in this combination trial of the vector and the messenger RNA vaccines. Yeah, I think that's not that's I think that's a good idea. Yes, I think the vector vaccine will give some additional innate immunity that you won't get from just the protein. What I was just telling you, we were thinking of trying to stimulate with nonspecific vaccines months ago. So the vector containing specific vaccine will also give innate immunity because you have the 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 uh, carrier there. And especially if the carrier uh, reproduces itself, replicates a little bit, that would stimulate innate immunity. I, I kind of liked the ideas that were put into the I think it's the Oxford vaccine. Yes. Uh, I like the ideas that they were developing. Um, the, but these messenger RNA vaccines have, have certainly been more efficacious than we would have expected. But the combination, 
may be interesting. Dr. Yes. Rialo, if we do get those combinations and durability is an issue, are there safety concerns of having these vaccines repeatedly just in a few months' time in order to uh, stimulate this innate immunity or uh, just with these other more targeted vaccines to just try to protect yourself? I, I would have no fear of using measles, mumps, rubella or the oral polio in combination with these things. There's no downside. It would be, I can't even think of a theoretical reason why there would be a downside or a greater, or a greater uh, safety problem. But when you mix the, the new ones together the, that stimulate antibodies mm. and specific immunity, we just don't know. We don't have that experience. We have to see. Uh, I wouldn't think so. And that's certainly worth a small trial to see. Uh, I'm not uh, really depressed by the by some of the reports of safety issues with the anaphylaxis. That happens when you have a foreign protein going into people who are hyperallergenic or, you know, in, in some percent of the populations, as long as that's an extremely low number. We need to see more data. But, you know, right now, I don't think that's anything to say, oh, stop the, going forward with these, these trials. I think the vaccine is really important and we have to pursue it. Dr. Gallo, I'm really concerned about people around me that tell me they don't want to be the first ones to actually get this vaccine. It doesn't matter if they're the most vulnerable population. What do you say to them, given how widely spread this pandemic has become? It's a problem, as you know, as you're hinting about yourself. Uh, there's always that temptation. You know, I, I remember the phrase of the English writer Alexander Pope be not the first by whom the new is tried, nor yet the last to lay the old aside. But this is a public health emergency. This is a different issue. We have to all go forward with this. And so I don't think it's good to say, I want to see what happens with other people. Uh, but there will be other people. They'll get their wish. There will be plenty of people to take this. And so uh, particularly those that find themselves in danger, if they go to the high-risk groups and really demonstrate real efficacy and lack of complications. Healthcare workers, maybe uh, other people who see people right away early and that never know who they're interacting with, like police, um, mm. but especially the healthcare workers I, I, and the people in the nursing home, they're going to mm. be taking the vaccine. So I think that that will go away because there will be people they'll see. But I, but, Dr. Gallo, you know, we're just hearing now that the FDA that the FDA has uh, voted that the Pfizer vaccine for COVID-19, the benefits of that vaccine outweigh the risks after weighing up the Pfizer vaccine data. So that was really the reaction that or the the result that we were expecting, right? And we right. assume, even though that review is non-binding, we assume that is just one step towards uh, getting the emergency use authorization for the deployment of the first yeah. rollout of the vaccine. Dr. Gallo, I wanted to get your view on this story here. Here in Australia, we've seen the Australian government now cancel its order for the CSL-developed vaccine as there were issues with the clinical trial. Now, we, we know that, you know, we expect some stumbles, but part of the vaccine that they were developing comes from the HIV virus. And so some of these patients were testing false positives for HIV. Is this a big stumbling block, do you think? Because they've said we can't re-engineer this, this vaccine now. It'll take another year. Uh, you know, I, I, I have to say, I didn't know about this particular uh, vaccine using part of HIV. I did not know that. I'd have to know the part of HIV it uses. We, I, I, you know, they, they should be able to discriminate because, look, we developed a blood test for HIV. It wasn't done at CDC. I was at NIH then, the National Cancer Institute. It's my group that developed the blood test for the world for HIV, both first generation and second generation put into operations by companies, but we did the science of it. And one of the things we did do was bring a procedure to clinical medicine for the first time. It's called the Western blot. It looks at all the proteins of the virus. So when you have antibodies, you see the pattern of the proteins of the virus. Certainly the vaccine you're talking about in Australia and from Queensland did, did not use all the genes for HIV structural proteins. They, they could not do that and would not do that. So I don't under, frankly speaking, 
I have to, I just have to mm. read what, what the details of this. I heard of it. Mm. Um, thank you for drawing my attention to it. I need to know exactly what genes they were using. And I, I don't imagine that they use the Western blot. The maybe, maybe they, the first part of the test is something like an ELISA or something like that. But all they have to do is follow up with a Western blot and that'll take any, anything confusing away, I would strongly suspect. But maybe it's because today the HIV blood test has probably been streamlined to things that are, it has been faster, easier, but nothing replaces uh, looking at all the viral proteins. And that could answer the question very quickly and it's not that expensive. And it was used all along in the early years in 85 and 86 and 87, 88. I, things began to change after with fancier tests or easier tests. I don't know where we are mm. today, what Australia does. I'd have to know what's in that, the genes of, of the vaccine, and I'd have to know exactly how you do your blood tests. I would not right. imagine that that's a long-term problem. Dr. Gallo, we're getting a little bit more detail on that FDA vote, and we're now getting that the advisors uh, back Pfizer vaccine in a 17 to 4 vote with one abstention. Tell us a little bit about the challenges of distribution, mass distribution when it comes to these vaccines. We finally have a vote. We could see the same process with Moderna next week. Yes, the, the, that's, a big, that's the big issue. I cannot speak to how well they're able to produce. That's you have to get from companies. You know, they don't tell us that. I don't know that. They have to get that from FDA, from, you know, the government sources that are reviewing it are the companies themselves. So the first thing is, will they be able to make enough for the population that they're seeking to cover? I cannot answer that. But that's always the first question. But these are significant organizations and they have significant amount of money from the government, that's for sure. So I don't imagine getting up to snuff on production will be a major bottleneck. It'll, it'll have bottlenecks, I suppose. But again, you have to deal with them of that. The other problem is, though, the messenger RNA vaccines, uh, at least one of them, the Moderna one, there, you, you have to really keep it very cold. And mm. when you get to tropical nations, that, that presents problems, the so-called cold chain um, problem. And that, we'll have to see. Can they solve that problem okay? I, I don't know. That's mm. a, uh, you know, really going to be more of a, a kind of a local engineering thing and what we have in place for other vaccines will have to be mobilized for that purpose. I mean, it's been done before. Again, I want to tell you, that's one of the reasons that drove me to think about repurposing old, live, attenuated vaccines mm -hmm. like measles, mumps, rubella, and oral polio. That can cross-protect for a while and maybe work for a few months. They have no problem in solving the cold chain with that. It's been done. It's, it's there. So in an emergency, we, mm -hmm. we have that to think about again. And we're going to be talking about that in a meeting that begins tomorrow at 8 o'clock my time. And in fact, I'm giving the opening talk on it. So we still think about that for future pandemics and epidemics, and even here if things go wrong uh, or and needing help. But I, it's not possible for you or me to know about what their problems will be for distribution of the vaccine. It'll be a problem, but I think it's one that this kind of company is, is equipped to maybe not completely handle, but with partnerships, I think we'll, they'll be able right. to handle it.